name is Damien Toledo. I'm a co-founder and developer at Nyamata. So today I'm going to talk briefly about our journey into uh, microservices architecture. So it's going to be just one example of a company using microservices to build their own product and how you can get started. So I, I don't intend to cover everything, but how do you start, right? And one question you may have in mind is, does it make sense for all companies to add up this type of architecture? Um, you know, we've seen that the web giant will adopt this architecture, right, for agility and scalability, but for a small startup or for regular enterprises, it makes sense. And our answer is obviously yes, yes, yes. Um, just for the agility, and that's why I was asking actually the question to Adrian. The agility is what you gain, even if you are a team of three people, it makes sense. So I'm going to just cover how do you start with, with, with this journey. So um, just a word about Nirmata. So you understand the scope of the application that we have to build. Uh, as Adrian said, you know, today every business is a software business. And uh, we believe that everybody is going to be impacted by, by this transition to cloud. Right? Cloud computing is the new paradigm for computing. So it's the same transition that we've seen from uh, for you know mainframe to client server. Today we are seeing that for monolithic application to uh, microservices. That's that type of transformation, and all enterprises are going to be impacted, or they will have to, to follow that if they want to survive. So our mission is really to enable and help enterprises in that journey, and our first focus is to enable the continuous delivery of cloud applications. So we cover things like um, application orchestration, service networking, uh, service analytics. So Adrian and Sudhir talk a lot about that, and it's very critical in that context. So we want to be focused on analytics for microservices and more kind of um, developer-centric analytics. And we provide also governance and security because our solution is clearly an enterprise solution. Uh, so these aspects are very important. So that's the scope of what you know, we, we are building. So when we started about uh, eight months ago, we, we had clear design goals. Um, we wanted our application, our own application, to be cloud native, obviously, because we believe in that and we want to help customers adopting this type of paradigm. So for that, we wanted the application to be composed of multiple services, each service uh, being elastic and resilient. So we covered some, that in some of the presentations already. And really, ultimately, what we wanted, even for a very small team, is really to optimize for software delivery. That was our main um, goal. So for that, we wanted to adopt a service-oriented architecture, so each developer could work independently on a given service or a couple of services. And we wanted uh, the services to be composable. Right? When when a request comes to a service, the request can be served or uh, processed by multiple services. And we wanted also to be cloud agnostic. So we started um, our developments on AWS, Amazon, but we wanted uh, you know, the ability to, to run on different clouds, yeah, including private clouds if possible. So these are the design goals that we set up for ourselves. So challenges, uh, Sudhir talked about some of them, but for us, we identified initially these challenges. Uh, first, it really requires a common infrastructure for all for these services to work well together. And in our case, we started you know, studying what was out there, and we decided to, to go with Netflix OSS. And what's interesting is that you know they, they showed a lot of different components. Uh, currently, there are more than 40 components, right? Uh, in the Netflix OSS, but we really started with four of them. And that's, that's kind of the, uh, the goal of my talk today, is that you don't have to understand these 40 components to get started. You can start with a very small subset, uh, The other challenge is really on the delivery and operation side of your application. You know? So you have all these services, and potentially you, run, you, you want to run your application in multiple environments, staging, production, development. And you may want to run multiple versions of each service in this environment, right? And in our case, we want to run on different clouds. So you can see that here, the, the matrix to operate all that is fairly complex. So it requires quite a lot of tooling on top of 
uh, of this to, to be able to, to work efficiently. So in our case, we decided to add a Docker after a while. Actually, we, we didn't start on day one uh, with Docker. It took us about a couple of months to add a Docker. And we started using that internally, actually, to save on our uh, Amazon bill. So we, we were able to pack our services on just one instance, basically. And then we realized that, well, the customer may, might be interested by, by that as well. So that's really part of our solution. But we had to develop a uh, significant orchestration on top of Docker to make it work. So in our case, it made sense because we wanted to offer that to customers. So we had the luxury to spend all that time developing the orchestration. Uh, it, it won't make sense for most companies to, to write that type of orchestration. So that's something we want to, to provide. Obviously. So a few words about, yes. A yeah, quick question. You said you use Docker initially to save on the Amazon bill. Right. But Amazon allows you to have smaller and smaller machine sizes, right? Maybe right. Like your instances, did you need instances smaller than your micro instance? So I'm trying to figure out, couldn't you just have a smaller instance rather than using Docker? Right. So they, they, there are several answers to that question. We, if you just um, if you just compute, actually, you, know, you take the smallest instance, uh, uh, micro instance, well, first of all, they don't recommend to run that in production. They say you have to start with a small. And then you, you, you make the math between taking a large instance or multiple small instances, and you, you, you'll see that you save up if you just use a large instance and pack services on that. On that. It's a question of does the pricing. But there are all other benefits, and I'll talk just briefly about that. So are many of people I think they understand what Docker is. Okay, so roughly half of people. So for, for the other people, half of the people, like, let me um, talk briefly about Docker and why it makes sense in, um, in this type of architecture. So Docker is an open source uh, technology that is used to build, ship, and, and uh, run your distributed application. So at the high level, it looks like that's something we, we may want to use uh, for uh, microservices architecture. So, in essence, what you can do uh, to simplify, if you have a service and uh, let's say it's a, it's a Java web service and you have a, a var file, so your build system is going to build a var file. Right? So at that point, what you can do is use Docker to build a Docker image. So there is a, a small language, you have a Docker file, and describing all the dependencies of your uh, service, and you are going to build an image. What you can do then is to push that image in a central repository. Think about, about that like it's, uh, it's a, the equivalent of uh, GitHub for images. So you can have Docker registry where you push your images. And from that point, what you can do is to go on any host running Docker, and you can pull that image. And from that, you can start one container, two container, 10,000 containers from that image. Right? And now you have containers, and within these containers, you have your service run. So it has um, a lot of interesting uh, side effects that you, you can benefit from. So first you have a clean separation of concerns between building something and deploying and operating something. And it provides you with runtime portability for your microservices. So that, that's a huge game right there if you want to run on multiple clouds potentially. And what Docker did really brilliantly is to simplify all that and kind of standardize the way these containers can be manipulated anywhere in the cloud. So it makes really a lot of sense, and there's a lot of efficiency you can gain from that. Uh, one question that people often ask when they start learning about Docker is what's the difference with a VM? Uh, here is a, just a few points here. Uh, on a VM, really, you have a guest OS uh, that is not shared across your VMs, right? Each VM has a guest OS, and then you have your application, and your Dependence is all part of your VM. With Docker, it's, it's different. You don't have a guest OS. All the containers share the same host OS. So it means really two things. It's very fast to start the Docker container. It's a matter of milliseconds. And the footprint of these containers are also quite small. And that's why you can actually pack a lot of services, microservices, on one single host instance. But there are obviously pros and cons. You know, between containers and VMs. Uh, people say that um, 
the isolation is not at the same level between uh, containers and, and uh, units. So you have to choose. But for microservices, of course, it made a lot of sense to, use, to go with containers. So here is the kind of the current architecture of our um, solution. Just to give you an example, so it's a bit simplified. So each gray box is actually a microservice, a microservice instance. So you may have, for instance, for the config service, you may have multiple instances, right? And um, just talk about the different patterns that you may have in uh, microservices. Here we have mainly two patterns between, uh, you know, requests coming in into the system, and then we have on the back end some messages, asynchronous coming. So I'm, very, I'm not going to talk about everything you need to develop all that, because on day one we didn't have all that. Where we started uh, is really with only two Netflix components, the gateway tool that you can see on top, and the registry, Eureka. So why, why do they make sense actually when you want to, to start uh, with your microservices? So I have a little bit uh, zooming about what's going on in the SaaS. So if you look at uh, at the top, you can see that Zool is, is the gateway that provides one single entry point to the whole application. So you may have hundreds of services. Externally, you see just one endpoint for all your uh, REST services. So what's, what's happening is each instance, uh, the grid boxes, what they do is to regist they register to Eureka initially. And think, think of it as it's very, something very dynamic. Instances, they come and go. For scaling reasons, or because one instance may fail, so the registry is going to, you know, keep track of all the instances coming up and, you know, disappearing for scaling reasons, for instance. So when a request com comes in in Zool, uh, what happens then is there is a filter. You can configure a filter to decide where the request should go, and in this case, it's designed to go to microservice A. But that's, that's not it, because potentially you have multiple instances of microservice A, and that's where uh, the Eureka client is useful in, or used in, in, uh, in Zool. Uh, you get the list of all the instances of, for microservice A, and then the load balancing that uh, Sodio was describing happens at that level. There is uh, load balancing happening between Zool and your microservice A. And then you may have different types of communications happening, so you, Typically, you would answer immediately that request and start some processing in the back end. Um, since you have stateless services, you will want to block and make, you know, just block in post. And then the other services may, may do the same thing. So there is really a load balancing, uh, not only you know, between your gateway and your microservice, but also between microservices. So the east-west traffic is also load balanced in that case. So that's what uh, Ribbon actually provides to you, and it's very useful. So you don't need um, a load balancer at the top of your application. You have the load balancing up, happening, um, you know, between your east and west uh, traffic. Yes. Quick question: uh, Deployment and you have each microservice is in a container. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to say that. Um, so each instance, each gray box here is running in one container, and we don't have to care about. Is it running on the, on the VM, on the Amazon instance, or whatever? So that, that's how this actually, these two components, Zool and Eureka, can be used initially, and we built everything around that after that. We put that in place, and then we started adding <coughs> microservices one after another. Obviously, at the end, you, you may need much more than that, but that's where you can start. So I, I would uh, really encourage you. So these two functions are critical in microservices, the gateway and the registration and discovery of services. What's Ribbon do? What, what's Ribbon do? Ribbon? So we, Ribbon is, is really um, the, the HTTP client here in this case, uh, forwarding the, the request to your microservice and also doing the mid-tier load balancing. It does these two things. And as we just heard, there is a new version of, of it coming, come, coming soon right? with uh, seamless migration. <laughs> okay, so uh, let, let's do a, a small uh, demo. Actually, I have a quick demo to, to finish the, the discussion. If we can switch to. So, what I'm going to do is. 
So you, you saw the, the architecture of uh, our application, the SaaS. And this is our solution to, uh, to operate microservices application. So our application is a microservices application. So what we're going to do here is deploy our application using our application. We do not confuse. <laughs> so um, there's a bit of setup that you would have to do for that. And the first thing is that you want to decide on you know, which cloud provider you want to use to deploy your microservices application. So here we're going to use uh, AWS. Uh, we support you know, System Core InterCloud, OpenStack, and vSphere. The next step in the case of AWS, we discover the SGs that have been uh, created. And you can decide to pick a couple of them to form a host group. So in this case, we have two host groups. Uh, one that will use to deploy the application in production environment, and another one uh, that will be used when we want to deploy a staging environment. And they map to different ESGs. One that uses extra large uh, instances in Amazon, and the other one just large instances. And should verify that they are already connected to the SaaS. Yeah. We should be able to use that. Okay, next step. So now we have our cloud resources identified that we want to use to deploy the application. So the next step is you can uh, define policies. And the policies will define how these cloud resources are going to be consumed when the application is deployed. So for instance, for this application, which happens to be our own SaaS, uh, we define these rules. So some rules will be used when we create a staging environment, uh, different rules for production, different rules for developers if they want to develop their own version uh, or their own copy of the SaaS somewhere. And if we have uh, you know, something like you know, uh, customers with a gold SLA, you may want to use different type of resources, cloud resources. And the last step of the setup is actually to define the blueprint of, our, of your application. And that will be critical to do all the placement and orchestration of the application. So I'm selecting the SaaS. And here you'll see that our SaaS is made of these microservices. And it looks familiar with the picture I showed you before, right? All the boxes which you saw in the architecture, you can find them here. So the way you define the blueprint of a microservice is you may want to define things like what is the size of the container you want to, to use. You can restrict the size in terms of memory or CPU shares to use. You can define the dependencies between microservices, and that's really important. Um, and this is used, for instance, to inject dynamically uh, properties like, um, let's say, the, the IP address of your registry into all the services, or the IP address of a database, things like that. So we, we support uh, different types of uh, injection. <coughs> and the very important thing here is actually the image <coughs> used for that microservice. So that's, that comes from the Docker registry. So the build system, we use Jenkins, generates the, the build uh, the image for that service. And then we can pull it when we deploy uh, the application. And there are other things you can define, like the ports you want to expose outside of your container for your application, and then all the environment variables. So you would do that for your microservices, and that's basically the blueprint of your application. Once you have that, you, you're good to go. You can define, you can deploy this application very easily in all sorts of environment, clouds, etc. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is we support different types of placement, and that's quite important especially if you want to save a little bit of money uh, in the cloud. Uh, so when you define a rule, you can say what type of placement you want for this container. Do you want all your containers in one instance? Do you want to optimize for performance and spread across all the cloud resources you have? So you can define that in your rules. So we already have a production environment running here. And if I drill down, I'll see that you know, everything is looking fine. And here, uh, due to the placement rule I defined, I can see that they're all running on the same host, basically the same uh, <coughs> instance. 
And what I'm going to do is to deploy a new one, so we'll see dynamically what, what happens. I'm going to create a new environment. So let's say I'm going to create a staging environment for a QA team. Assuming you have a QA team in your company. So you select the application you want to deploy, meaning the blueprint. Uh, so we do support versioning. So versioning at the application level may sound a little bit strange now if you understand the concept of microservices. So think about it as just a snapshot of, of, of your current state of your application. And just if you need to restart at a given state, you, you can do that by using version. Obviously we support versioning and tagging of Docker images at the service level, and that's really what's important. Uh, so let's say we want to deploy the latest version and we select the staging uh, type of environment. And that will select the right rule and which will select the right host group, the right cloud, etc. So all the policies come into play by selecting uh, the application and the type of environment. We can deploy this and then what will happen is now dynamically we are going to use this application blueprint and pull the images uh, you know, from the Docker registry to create the containers. And then one by one, um, by respecting also the service dependencies, we are going to place this container at the right place. Uh, in this case on Amazon, but again, it could be on uh, VMware OpenStack. We support all that. So what's interesting here is once you've deployed the entire application, you can start acting really at the service level, now you can start adding new versions of a given service, for instance, my config service. Uh, my build system has generated uh, multiple, you know, multiple builds for that uh, service, so I can pick the one I want and deploy the second version of the same service, config service, in the same environment. So, and then you can start doing your testing and looking at your uh, statistics to see if this new service is okay or not. And then you would retire the old one by just deleting. So I'll show you that through the UI, but obviously you can do that uh, through REST APIs and CLI, and link that to your Jenkins to, to do the, the whole automation, the continuous delivery. And then you have some uh, analytics associated to that. Still working on, on that, on making that uh, rich and very useful. So there's still a bit of work on that, but you, know, you start, you can see that dynamically, then it should be top five. And it's top 10 here. Um, so you can see, for instance, that the gateway Zool is taking a lot of memory right now during deployment. So that, that's how you can um, define an application based on microservices and start operating it. Again, for us, it made sense to develop the whole orchestration, and that's what we want to offer to kind of regular enterprises, right? Uh, not everybody will have the, the mean. Uh, to, to spend a lot, a lot of time on the orchestration of the application like that. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. yes. Um, service recovery, if you're the service diagram, that's part of the orchestration. Uh, auto scaling, resiliency, this is part of it. No, we don't support that yet. Yeah, that could be added in the staging system. Is that for communications between the VPS services server? Yeah, it's between your, your microservices. In our case, we use uh, Kafka. How do you integrate with the uh, the source control? With the source control? And the of the Right. So for us, we, we do that. Uh, so we use Jenkins. And um, you know, Jenkins just do his job using the, uh, the source code management and generate uh, bar files. And then we have a um, special script building these Docker images and pushing that into the Docker registry. Right. And here we just have the reference, you just need the reference to that image and we can do the orchestration based on that. Yes? Can, can you see the dependencies there? Like you define your blueprint? Yes. So the, the dependencies, I should flash that quickly. Show you that again. 
Yeah, and obviously dependencies are something very important when you, you start to deal with uh, microservices. So I'll give you the example, for instance, of the config service um, that needs to be that actually. For config service, and here you define your dependencies. You could have you have all your services that are available here, and you can say my services depending on all this. So it means that the, the config service here, um, we would need first to start MongoDB, then the registry, and then we can start this service. That's what it means to defend the dependencies. And it's tied also to the dependency injection. For instance, if you look at here carefully, we are defining all the Java options for this service. And here you have some something like we're injecting the IP address of Eureka. And you just have to say, to give the name of the service, obviously we take care of understanding where your IK is deployed, which cloud, which instance, etc. And we inject that thing. Yes? Uh, I see that different services have different types of dependencies. Yeah. Uh, what are the differences between them? So since they are all running on the same instance and the IP seems to be the same, how do you determine which service? Right. So, so there are two things. First, if you don't do anything, so if you fix the port yourself, when you define the, the container, uh, we take care of detecting the port collision. So in that case, we would place, the, if two services uh, want the same port, we would place the second service on the different host. The second thing you can do is uh, dynamic allocation of ports. So when you define the port here, um, you can leave the host port, the one that is exposed externally, you can leave it, can leave it blank. And in that case, we manage the port range. We allocate dynamically, and we look at on the host, okay, what are the ports that already are in use, and we can allocate a new one. If you need a fixed port, it doesn't work again. In that case, we place that on a different host. But in some cases, it makes a lot of sense to just allocate dynamically these ports. Sure. And then your, uh, your system informs the application and you need to find which port it is using. Exactly. Right, no more question. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, and thank you to all the speakers and our guests uh, and our host, Cisco. Good night. Well, will the slides be available? The slides? We will post some of the, the videos, yes. and it's up to the speakers there to put the slide.